Morning, folks. Good morning. It's good to see everybody again. Uh, turn with me in the Word of God to uh, the book of Galatians and chapter 1. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1. I've been, uh, we've been working through the book of Galatians on a uh, Sunday evening at, at Providence. And I remember many years ago, uh, Colin saying to me, every, every church should, should work through Galatians and Romans. And I, I remember thinking uh, back then, well, surely these things are, are well known. Surely there's other, other things that could be considered. Um, but I have to say, uh, since the turn of the year, having really done a verse-by-verse -verse study of the book of Galatians, how much I've learned personally uh, and what a blessing that, that I've had, um, but also s some real challenges from, from the Word of God. And I'd like to share, um, really, uh, this morning from chapter 1, some clear warnings uh, and challenges that, that God gives through Paul to the churches. And what was good then for the churches at Galatia surely will be good for us today. So we'll read chapter 1 uh, of Galatians together, and then I just want to um, spend a bit of time, verses 6 through to verse uh, 10. But in order to put that into context, we'll read the whole of the first chapter of Galatians together. So Galatians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ, and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia. Grace be to you and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you, than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received, let him be accursed. For do I now persuade, persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. But I certify you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached of me is not after man. For I neither received it of man, neither was I taught it, but by the revelation of Jesus Christ. For ye have heard of my conversation in time past in the Jews' religion, how that beyond measure I persecuted the church of God and wasted it, and profited in the Jews' religion above many my equals in mine own nation, being more exceedingly zealous of the traditions of my fathers. But when it pleased God, who separated me from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, to reveal his Son in me, that I might preach him among the heathen, immediately I, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. Neither went I up to Jerusalem to them which were apostles before me, but I went into Arabia and returned again unto Damascus. Then after three years I went up to Jerusalem to see Peter and abode with him fifteen days. But other of the apostles saw I none, save James the Lord's brother. Now the things which I write unto you, behold, before God, I lie not. Afterwards I came into the regions of Syria and Cilicia, and was unknown by face unto the churches of Judea which were in Christ. But they had heard only that he which persecuted us in times past now preacheth the faith which once he destroyed, and they glorified God in me. Let's just pray. <clears throat> Father, we thank thee. Uh, once again to be able to get, gather together such as this we thank thee lord for the word of god we pray afresh this morning lord that this letter that was written some two thousand years ago might be as real and as challenging and as exciting to us today as it was to those churches when it was first read mm. by thy holy spirit lord give us eyes to see and ears to hear this morning for we ask it for christ's sake Amen. Amen. 
Paul writing to the church at Corinth says for if the trumpet make an uncertain sound who shall uh, prepare for the battle who shall be ready for the battle and I fear today um, the trumpet the church is making an uncertain sound I fear the church and I've shared this with you with you many times you know my views on these things the church is is in in chaos the church is in disorder the message that it's called to preach is is lost is changed is watered down is is corrupted and the people out there uh, are not hearing generally speaking the truth that God wants them uh, to hear I had the misfortune this morning of uh, just putting on the um, BBC breakfast on the telly never ever watch never ever watch um, TV on a Sunday morning never normally have time but we were up early this morning and then there of course was um, a lady reverend and some of the things that, that she's coming out with my heart just sinks and I don't know whether to be angry or I don't know whether to be sad because people out there, lost people out there, are getting a weak, uncertain message. A wrong message in many cases. And Paul, writing to the churches at Galatia, gives them a very stern and a very clear warning about perverting the gospel, about changing the gospel, about giving heed to any that would do any of those things. Of course... Paul had been out on his first missionary journey. Paul had preached the gospel that the Lord had given to him. And we read something of that in the back part of the chapter that we read together. And people had been saved and churches had been established. And when Paul left them, they knew the truth. They'd heard the truth. They were aware of the truth. The truth had saved them. The churches had been born. But then, of course, Paul goes away. God has called him to to other things and things take a turn for the worst which is where we pick it up in verse uh, 6 and before we start it's important Paul gives an introduction to this epistle and then the first thing he does is begins to deal with the problem that he's aware of how unpopular today are preachers that deal with problems that need to be dealt with people want to come to church and people want to hear all the good things and all the nice things and all the positive things which absolutely there's a place for but we also need preachers we also need men and women of God that will tell people the truth that will tell people what they need to hear not what they want to hear and God has called us I believe to do that so thank God for people who tell us sometimes what we don't want to hear. And, and those of us that are married, that's normally our husband, or uh, more likely our wives, men folk, we're the ones that, who, whose wives tend to tell us the things that others uh, won't tell us. But praise God for that. But spiritually, it's really, really, really uh, important. You know, a, a lot of us want to surround ourselves with people who will just pat us on the back and say, great job, well done. And there's a time and a place for that. But we need people who are going to be faithful and true and tell us when we're getting things wrong. And Paul, out of a heart of love and care for these churches here that God has used him uh, to plant, pours his heart out to them. I think you get a sense of that as we read, read through this. He's pouring his heart out to these churches because they've allowed error in. And things are not going as they should be. And out of a real concern, Paul is writing to them and seeking to get them back uh, on course because it's only pleasing God that's important to him. He's not interested about pleasing men. We'll think about that a little later. He's interested in pleasing God. And we, we pick up in verse 6. I marvel that ye are so soon removed from him that called you he marvels he said i've heard 
What's going on? I've heard about the, the, the people that you are allowing in. I've heard about the things that are being done to the gospel. And, and I marvel, I'm surprised, I'm concerned, maybe even I'm angry. Because it was, the Bible says, so soon. So soon after you were saved. So soon after you heard the truth. So soon after I left. You moved. So soon you moved. You know, it doesn't take long. It doesn't take long for error to come into a local company of believers. It doesn't take long for wolves in sheep's clothing to attack the local church. And they'll do that generally by infiltration. And we've seen that through time, haven't we? It doesn't take long for some men of God, some women of God, maybe to leave a local company of believers. And then error comes in. And things are allowed that once weren't allowed. And were, once weren't allowed. And, the, and the preaching moves from being straight down the middle to over to the left or over to the right. And it happens so soon. You remember in the history of um, the nation of Israel, it was one generation and there a generation rose up that knew not the Lord. That's why God puts oversight into local churches. That's why God gives men responsibility for local churches. That's why he calls shepherds to sheep the flock. Because to shepherds to shepherd the flock. Shepherd the sheep. Put my teeth in. <laughs> because we as sheep will wander astray. We as sheep will allow ourselves at, to be at times to be moved and to be led where we shouldn't go. And God in his wisdom has put shepherds in charge of the flock with responsibility for the sheep. Praise God for that. Error quickly came in and Paul says, I, I just marvel. I marvel. You knew better than that. You heard my preaching. You heard the truth. You saw my testimony when I was with you. And yet so soon have you been removed. The Bible says, Move from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. I think this can apply. Be interesting to hear your thoughts afterwards. I marvel that your son soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. Sometimes I read that and I think the him that called you could be Paul. Sometimes I read that and think the him that called you is the Lord himself. Um, could be both. I don't know. Sometimes God leaves these things in his word deliberately so. Maybe we can have a conversation about that afterwards as to who the him is there. But the fact remains... Whether it was Paul or whether it was Christ, Paul's was Christ's servant. So the truth is such. They had rejected the teachings, they had rejected the preaching, and they had rejected the example of both. And that grieved Paul's hearts. And what were they moved from? They were moved from him that called you into the grace of Christ. We've thought much about grace this morning. How can a preacher in 20 minutes, half an hour, preach about the grace of Christ? A preacher could preach for the whole of his life and never plumb the depths or reach the heights of the grace of Christ. But, but Paul writing to the Ephesian church, you know the verses so well. For by grace are ye saved, through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And that's the grace of Christ that they were removed from. They were saved by grace and they were kept by grace. And works had nothing to do with it. The whole thing was a gift 
of God. And somebody had come in after Paul had gone and somebody had got hold of these, these churches in Galatia and somebody had started to preach error and suddenly it wasn't salvation by grace anymore and suddenly we weren't kept by grace anymore and suddenly the gospel of Christ had been polluted and, perver and perverted and people were being led astray in error. So soon. So soon. Be very, very, very careful about who we allow to influence in our church, well, in the Lord's church and the church that he has given us responsibility for. Now, the Bible says they were moved unto another gospel. Another gospel. And I suppose to understand what that means, we need to understand the gospel that we are called to preach. Somebody gave me a leaflet the other day for... Um, some kind of, of, of Christian shindig that was going on and I looked at it and it was a very nice leaflet, very well presented and on the front it had got the usual verses quoted uh, that and he went out healing the sick and raising the dead and casting out demons and then the bottom was and preaching the gospel of the kingdom and I, I, I read this leaflet and, and Again, my heart sank. My heart sank. We are not called to preach the gospel of the kingdom. The Lord Jesus Christ preached the gospel of the kingdom when he was here on earth. The, kingdom, the king was there. The kingdom was on offer. And the Lord Jesus Christ healed the sick. And the Lord Jesus Christ raised the dead. And the Lord Jesus Christ gave sight to the blind. And he did so uh, throughout his ministry. And he preached the gospel of the kingdom. John the Baptist preached the gospel of the kingdom. And this leaflet was going out and, and the clear impl implication was come to this meeting and you'll hear the gospel of the kingdom and you'll, you'll, you'll see sight to the blind and you'll see the dead being raised and you'll see all these miraculous and wonderful things. And again, a bit like this morning, I felt angry and I felt sad and I felt this whole host of emotions. And then of course there are uh, others that will say well the gospel is yes you need to believe in God but you need to do X, Y and Z. And it's a faith and works gospel. And it doesn't matter which religion you look at, it doesn't matter which cult you look at, there will be an element of of that is that the gospel that we're called to preach are we saved by believing in god and coming to church are we saved by believing in god and being baptized are we saved by believing in god and following the ten commandments no we are not are we kept by doing any of those things no we are not we are saved by the grace of God and we are kept by the grace of God so what is the gospel that Jesus Christ is calling us to preach what is the gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ wants anybody that walks through the doors of this place or any other place to hear if it's not the gospel of the kingdom if it's not the gospel of believing God and do something good what is it well, turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm preaching to the converted here this morning, I know. But it's good just to remind ourselves of these things. 1 Corinthians 15. Verse 1. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel which I preached unto you. Couldn't be any more clear than that which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand. By which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. Here we go. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. What is the gospel that you and I are called to preach? What is the gospel that the church in this dispensation is called to preach? It is the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus 
Christ. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Turn with me to Romans 10. Romans 10. Verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's as simple and as powerful as that. It's nothing to do with law keeping. It's nothing to do with church attendance. It's nothing to do with baptism. It's nothing to do with anything else. It is the death, burial and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible says if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in our heart that God hath raised him from the dead. It doesn't say we might be saved. It doesn't say we can be saved. The Bible says thou shalt be saved. Praise God for that. That's assurance. That's absolute assurance on a promise of God. And if you believe that gospel this morning, and if you believe that truth this morning, then you are saved. There's something much more powerful, isn't there, when you say you are, when you replace that with thou shalt. There's a power in that. There's a majesty in that. Thou shalt be saved. And that's the power of the word of God. So that is the gospel that we are called to preach. That is the gospel that Paul preached when he went out on his first missionary journey. And he came to the region of Galatia. That is the message that he preached. And that is the message that saved the souls there. And saw those churches born. But sadly, sadly, they were moved from that gospel unto another gospel. How careful we need to be. How careful we need to be of anything that seeks to pervert the gospel, of any one that seeks to pervert the gospel, of any element that comes in to change that truth. You see, Paul goes on to say in verse 7, which is not another but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. It's not another gospel because there's only one gospel. There's only one gospel that can save you. There, there may be many things that might be called a gospel, but there's only one gospel that saves. And there are some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. Now we need to be very, very careful about these people. This is one of the great problems I have with the with the churches together movement and, and well I have a whole host of problems with, with with that but this is one of the dangers of it of course is there are those there that believe another gospel and they trouble you or they should trouble you if you're saved they should trouble you because you should be concerned about the gospel that they preach now just come with me to Galatians chapter 5 So there's some in chapter 1 that are causing trouble and perverting the gospel of, uh, gospel of Christ. Chapter 5 and verse 7, Paul writes in still to these churches, he says, Ye did run well. You did start really well. You believed the gospel. You were saved. You were involved in the local church. God built a church. You did run well. But then look what happened. Who did hinder you that ye should not obey? the truth who was it who was it you started off so well and somebody has come in 
and hindered you. Somebody has come in and troubled you. And you're not now running as you should be running. And you're not now running as well as you should be. I don't know where you are this morning, but who is it in your life? Who is it in your spiritual life that's hindering you? Who is it that's troubling you? It's always a who. There's always somebody. There's always some influence somewhere that is taking you away from where you should be. There's always somebody somewhere that's trying to get you perhaps to compromise on something. I've had it, I've had it recently, very, very recently. You know my, you know my stand on, on the King James Bible and uh, the issues that that's caused and still causes. Praise God for that. Um, but I had somebody recently really um, asking me if I would consider... Uh, taking on some office and responsibility within the church and we had a conversation about this issue of, of Bible versions and again I was accused of judging people, I was, I was accused of, of being unkind to people, I said I haven't judged anybody and I haven't been unkind to anybody you, you've asked me why I won't take on the office why I won't stand I haven't passed comment on anybody else I've just said that I can't while modern Bibles are being used. And then this uh, lady looked at me and said, can't you just compromise? Can't you just compromise for the greater good? No, <laughs> I can't. And I said to her, God has shown me, I believe God has shown me and given me much light on this su subject over 20 years and the dangers of the corruption that's going on with the modern versions. How can I stand before God and say I'm willing to ignore what you've shown me, Lord, just to please somebody else? There's always a who. There's always a somebody that will stand in your ear and say, just compromise on that. Just overlook that. Just don't bother with that. Who is it in your life? Who is it in my life? Because the Bible says when it comes to the purity of the gospel, they will trouble you and they will pervert your gospel and they will hinder you. And we need to be strong enough and we need to be courageous enough to say, Lord, Whatever they might say and whatever they might offer and however tempting it might be, I will not be moved. Have you noticed how few gospel preaching, Bible preaching churches there are now? We're getting fewer and fewer and fewer. There are not many places you could go to this morning where you can hear the true gospel, where you can hear the old book, where you can meet faithful believers. There are, there are remnants of us. Let's, let's, let's not be like Elijah. There are 7,000 that haven't bowed the knee to Baal, but, but we're considerably fewer than we, than we used to be. But there are many places this morning that you and I can go and hear error. There are many places this morning where you and I can go and hear a perverted gospel. And we need to be very, very careful that we're not drawn into these things. The, Galas the, the gospel of Christ in Galatia, the perversion came through adding works to faith. Adding works to faith. Law keeping, circumcision. That's what they were saying. That's what you need to do. You need to keep the law. You need to be circumcised. You need to take various elements and add it to it. That's what was going on in Galatia. That's what's going on in today. And of course, there are other perversions of the gospel as well. One that, that, that I've been dealing with recently. The gospel is prosperity. Believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be well. Believe in Jesus Christ, you'll be healthy. Believe in Jesus Christ and you'll be wealthy. And if you're not healthy and if you're not wealthy and if you're not prospering, then there's something wrong with your faith. There's something wrong with your walk in the Lord. I was, I was hearing uh, a lady was telling me uh, very recently 
of uh, somebody that she knew that was that was desperate to have a baby and had not been blessed with having a baby and uh, had come to uh, a church that I'm aware of and the preacher was asking her all sorts of questions this lady had not been baptized and the preacher said to her I'm telling you now it's because you're disobedient to God if you're baptized you will have a baby because God wants to bless you what kind of nonsense is this that we are preaching in our churches and it's everywhere it's everywhere there's a perverse gospel there is a perverted gospel that is troubling and hindering people and Paul is dealing with similar similar things in the churches at Galatia you see people will preach error there is no doubt about it 2 Corinthians 11 2 Corinthians 11 verse 3 but I fear lest by any means as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus whom we have not preached or if ye have received another spirit which ye have not received or another gospel which ye have not accepted ye might well bear with him what's what's paul saying here there's there's people that are going to come and they're going to preach another jesus and they're going to preach another spirit and they're going to preach another gospel and we need to be very very careful that is why the word of god is so important the only way the only test of error is is that man preaching the truth of the word of god is what he is saying does it line up with the truth of the Word of God? Is it in the right context? And that's why it's so important that we gather together and we fellowship together and we know our Bibles. It goes on in verse 8 of Galatians chapter 1. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you than that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. What gospel would an angel preach? What gospel would an angel preach if an angel came and preached? What gospel would an angel preach? It would, an angel would, if one came, preach the truth. And Paul's saying, even if an angel from heaven comes and preaches any other gospel, and preaches any other un untruth, then let him be a curse. This is really serious. And this is what struck me as I started this study in Galatians and this is what has continued to struck me as we go through it Paul is saying if any man or even any angel from heaven preaches any other gospel let him be accursed and it's so serious he repeats himself exactly in the same verse as we said before so say I now again if any man preach any other gospel unto you than that ye have received let him be accursed we need to take these things very 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 seriously what does it mean to be accursed what does the Bible say about that well just to give an idea come with me to Deuteronomy chapter 21 <clears throat> Deuteronomy 21 verse 22 it's of course under the law and if a man have committed a sin worthy of death, and he be to put and he be to be put to death, and thou hang him on a tree, his body shall not remain all night upon the tree, but thou shalt in any wise bury him that day, for he that is hanged is accursed of God, and that thy land be not defiled, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an 
inheritance. The body there that is hanging on the tree, the body that has committed, the man that has committed a sin worthy of death, he's hanging on a tree. The Bible says he is accursed of God. He's hanging on a tree. He's put to death. He's accursed of God. Joshua chapter 6. Joshua chapter 6. <clears throat> Verse <clears throat> 17. Speaking of course of Jericho. And the destruction of Jericho. Verse 17. Of Joshua 6. And the city shall be accursed. Even it and all that are therein to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot shall live. She and all that are with her in the house. Because she hid the messengers that we sent. And ye in any wise keep yourselves from the accursed thing, lest ye make yourselves accursed, when ye take of the accursed thing and make the camp of Israel a curse and trouble it. And of course, Jericho there was destroyed. And God said of those things that he said, the, the accursed things, if you read through it, don't touch them, don't take them, don't have them in your possession. And there were, there, were, there were some that did take them and God had to deal with them in the most severe way. So here we find in Deuteronomy that to be accursed is to associate with death on a tree. To be accursed here to, in the context of Jericho is for something to be completely destroyed. And we get the idea there of what God is saying. Woe to that man that preaches a gospel that is a perversion of the truth. And they will say to you and I that we're being unkind and that, that they'll say to you and I that we're being ungracious because we won't join the Make Way March around the town centre on, a, on, a, on, a, on an Easter morning or we won't join the churches together because of the things that are going on. Nor should we. Because if there are people there preaching error, if there are people there preaching a false gospel, if there are people there adding to the gospel of Jesus Christ, then the word of God says... They should be accursed. That's a serious statement in God's word. And it brings, I think, home to you and I an understanding of how precious and important the gospel is. Somebody said this, The gospel is divinely perfect. To add to it is to destroy it. And it's absolutely true. And I was, I was thinking... Why is God so um, direct on that? Why is God so serious about this? And it seems to me, I don't know, but it seems to me the true gospel is all about Jesus Christ. It's all about him. It's all about his holiness. It's all about his love. It's all about his perfection. It's all about his redemptive work on the cross. It is through him and him alone that you and I are saved. The minute that we add to that, we bring ourselves into the equation and we take away from the Lord Jesus Christ. We take away from all that he's done. We take away from all that he is and we put ourselves in the mix and say by some strange kind of way, I've helped the Lord save me. And God says that can never happen. That can never happen. There can never be a man or woman walking through the streets of heaven saying, I've done something to get here. I've earned this. It's all about Jesus Christ. When we open our Bibles at the book of Revelation and we see the Lamb on the phone and we see the four and twenty elders casting their crowns before him, there's only one person there getting the glory. And that's the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Throughout the whole of eternity, it's only the Saviour that gets the glory because the gospel is all about him and all about what he's done. And God says to pervert that and to trouble that and to preach anything different is to take away from what my son has done for you. And that cannot ever be allowed. That's the dangerous ground that men get onto 
when they seek to pervert the gospel of Christ. Finally, verse 10, For do I now persuade, persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I yet please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. A man pleaser is not a Christ pleaser. And a Christ pleaser is not a man pleaser. They cannot be so. No man seeking to please men will generally tell them the truth. Generally speaking. If I want to please men and I want to be well thought of of men, I won't tell them the truth. I won't tell them what they want to hear because they'll think ill of me and they won't, they won't want to be around me because people nowadays don't want to hear the truth. And the true gospel, the true gospel displeases many men. I've quoted it before, I'm sure others have as well. But Spurgeon said, if you haven't made somebody sad, mad or glad, you haven't preached the gospel. And how true that is. And how many lost souls this morning will come into church buildings and how many lost souls this morning will hear a message preached and will say, oh, that was lovely, thank you very much, and walk out the door. No nearer to the Lord than when they first came in because they've just had ears tickled and a pleasing message. How sad it is. If I do that I do, Paul says, I should not be the servant of Christ. Let's make sure that we are Christians that keep to the book. Let's make sure that we are Christians that keep to the old ways and the old gospel message that is as new today as it ever was and is as powerful today as it ever was. And believe you me, is as exciting today as it ever was. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. Praise God for such a simple, powerful, wonderful message and a wonderful saviour whom we can serve. Amen. Was that okay? <laughs> Was it in Pentecostal style? <laughs> Thanks, John.